All right, good evening, everyone. I am so incredibly thankful that you're all here with me this evening. Um, tonight's um, discussion is going to be intense. Um, it's going to be a little bit unlike anything I've done before. Um, for those of you that know Rabbi Kalmus, um, with Sion Breslov, I know Hope has um, mentioned him many times. Um, he and I had a discussion this morning, and I told him that I didn't want to give this class. And he told me, Binyamin, he said, you need to give this class, and you need to be as open with people and your true self as possible. And so I'm going to attempt to do that tonight to my own uh, uncomfortability. So we're gonna start as the Val Shem Kodesh used to do by doing some breathing and then we'll go into, uh, we'll go into the session. So if you could put both feet on the floor in case you happen to have one foot behind your head or under your legs or anything like that. And your hands not clasped together, put one on each knee, both your sides, whatever feels terrific to you, comfortable to you. As you could try to clear your mind, take in just a few regular breaths in and out. I ask you to do the Baal Shem Tov's breathing exercise with me that you take in deep breath for a five count. Hold for five. And out for five. In for five. Hold for five. And out for five. In for five, hold for five, and out for five. So I brought thought that the Rabbana Shalom should bless this space, it should be able to feel comfortable, at ease, searching our hearts for the things that upset us and give us pain tonight, that we should be able to search and explain and give over and to let go of things that trouble us. We should find comfort and solace amongst the cloud that we are here together also the Rabbanishan, that we are a part of the one, and that the one should give us strength, healing, and hope for the future. Amen. Tonight's class session is entitled The Mikvah of Our Tears. And I have to tell you that the past two weeks of my life, for whatever reason, perhaps with the ushering in of the month of Elo, have been very painful. I'm sure those of you that are empaths on this call or who are mystics in your own right, who have a connection to energy, empathy, know that the pain and suffering of others hits those of us particularly hard. And that's why many of us are called to helping professions. Some people are rabbis, hospital chaplains, you could have the ultimate duty 
being one of those customer service representatives who seems to always have to deal with the most painful experiences in life, particularly angry customers, those of us in Detroit, the ones who have lost power for the last four years. But I bring all this to light because took me some time to realize that all of us are sitting with an incredible amount of pain. And it seems to be that Elul is a time where that pain surfaces. If you'll permit me, I'm gonna share with you a little bit about my week. Perhaps about my experience. And a dear friend reached out to me a couple days ago. Unfortunately, someone that struggles with mental illness. Someone that I personally have taken to the crisis center for mental health. Reach out to me and say, I haven't slept in days. And I didn't want to tell you but I took 12 sweeping pills and I didn't care what happened next. I didn't want to tell you because I thought you'd be disappointed in me. And it's not that I wanted to end my life, but it's that I was so tired that I didn't know what else to do. By some miracle this morning, I woke up with nothing more than a little headache. Another friend about a month ago his birthday. He was on the way to a campground. And at the age of 25, he suffers from chronic headaches. His parents called me and said, Rabbi, our son was supposed to go out tonight and have the night of his life. And instead, he took 60 Tylenol PMs and crashed his car into a median. Will you come? This is the fourth time he's tried to overdose. So I went and I sat with him. And as the medication made its way out of his body after they told his parents that he would have to be lifted to a university hospital for a liver transplant. By some miracle, he also recovered. Two years ago, 
as a resident chaplain. I was working a night shift, University of Michigan Hospital. And I was paged at 11.30 at night to a pregnant mother who was exhibiting flu-like symptoms. On her arrival, she was in cardiac arrest. And the six month old fetus that was inside of her was no longer living. They had to deliver the baby. And I was asked to be with this family as they gave final blessings for this child. I remember so distinctly from that night, I was having to take them from the reflection room, as we call it, where the child was being held. Inevitably passing the trauma bay only a divider kept them from the chaos on the other side of the divider. I know, and I knew then, that they didn't. That their daughter, the child's mother, was the one with the 25 doctors giving her CPR as they passed. I couldn't tell them. I blessed that child that night. And by what may seem like a miracle or just a bad nightmare, and that child's mother woke up three months later. I was there with her when she met her. Non-living son for the first time. I know this is not what any of you expected to hear tonight. But I think it represents the pain and sadness that many of us carry for the experiences that we've had. And an incredible amount of pain and sadness and questions with an uneven amount of answers continues to be triggered and or released into our consciousness at perhaps the most inopportune times. And yet we subdue it, reminding ourselves that have to be joyous, we just have to accept, we have to understand that whatever is, is for the best. What I'm here tonight to tell you is, is that there is purification solace and even comfort in the tears that we pray the tears that we have that we shed over the loss and misfortune and the disappointment in our lives and I'm also going to tell you that 
anger at God, not liking the circumstances, are completely acceptable and completely Jewish. So why am I bringing this up now? A, because the last two weeks of my life have perhaps resurfaced pain and suffering I've witnessed in others. It's experienced and experienced over the last several years in a way that I have never had before. I don't think it's a coincidence. I'm also willing to bet that many of you have also had your own trials and tribulations over the last few days, weeks. Something triggered you, a scent, a vision, a person that perhaps you felt you just had to bear down and accept. But I can guarantee you that the pain and the sadness and the disappointment has many purposes. But one of those purposes is that we shed some tears. You should never forget that we are Hashem's partners in this world. We are stewards of this world. And based on both the good and the seemingly bad that we experience, it seems that we also have a bit of a say. Any uncomfortability in the challenges that we face. So I'd like to start, as if that wasn't enough of a start for you, by opening the floor. I want to hear what's troubling you. More importantly, Hashem wants to hear what's troubling you. As for Shalom, I don't ever want to portray myself as anything but a facilitator of your opportunity. Tell Hashem it's exactly what's on your mind. I can tell you, as Rabbi Nachman says, the cry of a Jew is incredibly precious to God. And that particularly now in Elul, say the king is in the field, as Hashem's listening ears are more in tune than they are through the rest of the year, although they're always in tune. They give everyone the opportunity as a collective and to Hashem directly to talk about the things. I know lightning bolts are going to come down, I promise you. I 
I'll speak. I'll speak. Okay. I'm not sure what I'm going to say, but Hashem will help me find the words. <clears throat> I've had a lot of things that have happened in my life that have been very hard and that have been very traumatizing. And yet I've reached a point in my life where I know that Hashem runs the world and I know that everything I went through has gotten me to this place that I'm in right now. I, I feel so blessed that I can say that. I mean, God forbid if, you know, something horrible happened, Ash Shalom, I, you know, can I say that? You know, oh, Hashem's in control and I'm okay. I don't know, but I just try to live my life like that um, because I've lived another way. Not that I ever blamed Hashem, but I certainly didn't, couldn't understand and sometimes still can't understand why things happen to people. But I'm at a place in my life now where I just have to look at everything. It's, it's okay. It's all good. There isn't anything else but Hashem. I mean, I'm just getting to really let that sink in and live that. And it's not easy. So I can't really honestly say that I have some horrible thing bothering me right now because I've worked for so many years through so much of my stuff that I feel like I'm in a, a, a pretty good place right now. I'm close with my family, Baruch Hashem, and I don't know, I just, I'm just learning and growing as, all, as we all are, and it's not easy. I don't find any of it very easy, but as long as I can put Hashem before me at all times, it makes my life, it makes the, the path a little smoother. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to share? Everyone else has had a perfect life. It's amazing. To get all of you in the same room on the same night. It's terrific. Not a perfect for perfect life by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I was your question, I think, is pondering. So is are you kind of asking about our last two weeks, our last month, our whole life? Um, I, I think that I, I misspoke and said last two weeks because that's been the frame of my reference. But I, I would welcome any, any um, meaningful experiences that still carry some, some feelings of hurt and sadness with you or anyone else? Some of mine, I don't really know what it is. I would assume that I'm an empath as well. So when I wake up and I'm really sad, um, I work really hard to try to shift that. Um, sometimes I'm successful and sometimes I'm not. Um, today was one of those days for some reason and I spent I don't know, probably an hour in meditation and spent about 15, 20 minutes 
sitting under a pecan tree in the grass with freezing cold water from the garden hose running over me because I needed to ground and I needed to get a real life that's not sad. And I was very grateful for having the ground and having God's love around me and him showing me his love and light. But, you know, you're still trying to shift that. So I was working. Um, Elul brings me to a place of reminding me what I what I long for. Um, so when I think about Elul, um, instead of being glad, I, it, it brings uh, sadness. I don't know that it's sadness. It's just a longing to be with him and him with me. Um, so kind of as I was sitting under the pine tree today, or not pine tree, the pecan tree today, I had a, you know, as if he's sitting there with me and um, surrounding me with his love. And I just have to envision that. Um, I just had a cousin Saturday was trying to evacuate Afghanistan and the airport was being attacked and they were no longer taking any more planes out. And, you know, Baruch Hashem, we all prayed and um, he is, he's safe, but there's thousands of people there that are not safe. Um, it's not just our United States, it's around the whole world, as you guys know. Um, but, you know, giving gratitude and thankfulness for that. But um, still find it difficult when I'm sad. It's like, I don't, I don't, there's nothing to be sad per se, except the pain that other people are feeling right now and in the deep sorrow that I know that Hashem has watching us all go through this probably, but so badly wanting all of us to make teshuva and um, it's like I don't, I'm not really sure what more to do. So very grateful for what I have, very grateful for all that's around me and, and thankful for all his love that he embellishes us all with, even though some, sometimes it's harder to see, even though he's there. Um, I don't know. It's, you said two weeks and I was like, yeah, it's been really difficult. I mean, like, it's crazy. I keep thinking, what is wrong with you? I mean, even today, I just told my husband, I was like, I can't, I can't associate with the news. I can't associate with stuff. It just creates so much, um, it's not really fear. It's just um, so much pain in me that I can't really deal with it. It's just, I can't, I can't, I don't even know how to deal with it. And then I want to find joy in whatever comes, comes available, <laughs> comes out every single day, every single moment in the now. And I don't, I, I have to shift out of that and keep giving God praise for wherever we're at. Um, kind of like I was mentioning last week about the miscarriage. It was like, I remember giving birth um, and I was kind of mad, <laughs> kind of a little mad. And my husband's like, you know, we have to praise God that this happened. And I was just like, Are you freaking kidding me. <laughs> but um. I told you last week, the big picture is, yes, I know he's still in control. And yes, I know. Um, and, and I, I, I thank him for that opportunity. As sadly as it seems to have gone through that, because I know other people do the same. And maybe one day I can help somebody else. Um, I don't know. Is that what you were looking for? <laughs> I'm not really sure. I think that's just kind of where I am right now. Every day is just a new trial and I'm like trying to, trying to turn it over to him and let him shed his love and light on me and draw on the light in so that I can feel him closer to me.
And as far as in being in the field, oh my goodness, I just kept repeating it today. And I, I will butch it up if I try it, but what you guys say for um, Ad Adonai, but it's not Adonai. I don't know. It's the saying that you say the first part and then the last part you reverse it. So hope know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. I can't unless I see it right in front of me. I can't remember. I have a ring with it on it. They're my beloved. No. Uh, oh, Ani my beloved. Yes. Yes. My beloved. And was, yeah, and I just sit there and ball. Every time I every time I even think about saying it, it's just I don't know that my tears are so so sad. It's just um, I just I long to be with him. So, and if I'm not with him in in like he is with me all the time, I have to figure out how I can help other people because we need to bring him in soon. That's my thought. When you say that verse, does it make you think of God? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Matter of fact, I forgot to put the ring on today. I was like, I'm going to go get my ring so that I keep. I have to see it because I don't have it memorized. I mean, it's that's not true. I probably have it memorized, but I can't quote it when I'm on camera. <laughs> so. But yes, it's definitely he is my beloved and I'm his and, and, and or whichever way you say that it's um, strong, huge desire that's always important in life and to share that with others. It's beautiful. Anyone else like to share? I wanted to just respond to Julie um, that um, it said that when. Oh, can you speak up a little louder? I can't hear you. Sorry. Let me, uh, uh, that better? Okay. Um, that, uh, when Hashem feels the furthest away from us, it's actually when he's the closest to us. So when your longing is the strongest, because he feels far away, he's actually closer. And in the month of Elul, that's even more so because he's in the field. So, so that's one thing I just wanted to say. And the other thing is that, um, you know, you said every day is a new trial, and that also is the month of Elul. You know, it literally is. <laughs> It is kind of the, the month of tests and trials and challenges. It's kind of, uh, you know, we're tested for, for you know, what, what, what we've, um, how we've grown throughout the whole year. And then this is kind of like the final exam heading into Rosh Hashanah. So, um, uh, so I actually had a huge test um, both yesterday and today. Uh, and I actually, in my Hizbodadut yesterday, um, prayed to Hashem to show me what I had to do to Shuva for. And then two hours later, had an explosion in a relationship that I had been spent, that I had been, you know, um, uh, that I've talked about, that I was uh, working um, on uh, uh, with the teaching of Azamra for, uh, you know, really like two years and had made so much like, like miraculous progress in this relationship. 
And then, you know, it was like, like, it was like that all evaporated in a snap. And it was very interesting because even in myself, the way I responded, it was like over something, like I had much bigger tests that I was able to remain silent and not respond, right? right? Which Rebbe Nachman says is like the highest form of response. You could just be silent in the face of um, someone, you know, uh, you know, humiliating you or, or, or whatever, and you don't respond, especially when you really want to. And um, I had much throughout the past two years with, in this relationship, and I had been able to, and with consistency, and this one wasn't even as challenging, and I just exploded. And it was interesting because I um, had a conversation, and, and, and afterwards, I just felt like, I, I really felt defeated. I felt like, you know, I mean, after all this time and I, I've made so much effort and I've done everything I could do and how could this have happened? And um, I was speaking to somebody about it and it's interesting because in a way you can, you can know things and even believe them, but if, you're, if you don't really let them into your heart on a, on a you know, kind of like soul level, which is infinitely deeper than just believing it. I mean, that really is a Muna. Um, you, they don't really necessarily, you know, it doesn't necessarily have that same transformative effect, um, which is returning to Hashem, which is the act of Teshuva. So what I realized was that the, I asked Hashem to show me what I had to do Teshuva for. And in the end, this was it. This was it because it really wasn't about the other person. It was about what it provoked within me, which was this very old conditioned, you know, it was all these, this pain and suffering and hurt that really started, you know, at, at, you know, as a child, like a very, very young child, two, three, four years old. And that I still haven't completely, um, you know, done teshuva on. Like there's still that momentum, right? Because when when you have teshuva shalema, the momentum doesn't come back. It's it just completely, um, you know, it, it 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 you really do return it all to Hashem to source. And so I've done it at levels and layers, and um, you know, and it just, as you, you go deeper and deeper, you know, it often comes back up again. And so it was Hashem showing me that I still have not really gotten to the core of, you know, this pain and suffering that happened at a very young age. And, um, and the recognition of that even allowed something to release. So all that momentum that I even felt over failing and, um, you know, and then even what, you know, the pain, the, the kind of like abuse that I created in responding to the person. And um, yeah, it just shifted everything. It shifted everything. So um, it's very interesting that it's not necessarily, it doesn't look necessarily the way we think it's going to look, right? So like we think, um, being tested is that we get tested and we succeed and that's teshuva but often teshuva is um really facing into what we still have to um give back to hashem what we still have to release what we still have to let go of in, in our own experience and the only way we can find that out really often is for it to come to the surface to really you know have it come up and see it and experience it. Um, and then, you know, and then in our Spodadut, give it over to Hashem. So the fact that, you know, I think we're probably all in our own way. I mean, we probably should be, so I'm assuming we all are because it is the month of Elul. 
you know, having different kinds of experiences, it doesn't mean that it's anything wrong at all. It actually means that, um, you know, Hashem is giving us this opportunity to really give it all back to him. Absolutely. One of the reasons that I brought this, thank you all for sharing, by the way. One of the reasons that I brought this topic up to talk about collectively is because we, as Hope just um, just mentioned so poignantly, that we're almost all going through all of this together. And we have proof for that. What's our proof? On Rosh Hashanah, we say to Hashem, Avinu Malkeinu. What's interesting about the, you know, Avinu Malkeinu? Can you tell me? Avinu Malkeinu is plural. It's meant to be said amongst a group of people. We, our father, our king, not my father, my king. When we stand together and we pound our chests, we say, Ashamnu Bagadnu. It's plural. We take responsibility as a community for the sins or the ways that we've fallen short as an entire community. And so the last two weeks where I've been feeling pain, disconnection, and diffusion, sadness. It became clear to me that all of us have. That all of us in some way feel far, but also close. We also have the saying, you feel far away from God, it's not God that moved. Since we're throwing them all out tonight. So the king is in the field. And the mikvah, something that almost every single Jewish person partakes in before Rosh Hashanah. Hasidish, Litvish, many conservatives have this tradition of going to the mikvah before Rosh Hashanah. It's something that we all collectively partake in because if even for just a few hours, all of us, regardless of our background, are one collective entity. Julie, you gave me a beautiful segue. Ani lidodi vidodi li. I, my beloved, is my beloved is to me. There are many, many places where Hashem and the Jewish people are likened to a bride and a groom. So when you see, sit under that pecan tree and you long for that groom, you sit there not just for yourself, but as we know that every single Jewish person has the opportunity to act and long and pray, pray on behalf of the entire Jewish people. So when you sit under that tree and you long for that connection, you represent not only yourself, but that longing of the entire cloud to return to their groom, to that celestial groom, to that connection that we all desire throughout the year, but perhaps can only once a year truly Facilitate. So 
So the mikvah of our tears, tears of joy, tears of disappointment, sadness, anger, represent not only emotion, but also a release, a return. Shuva, as we say in this month. But what it also does is it creates vacated space. Well, Shem Tov once traveled to a city. And he said to him, Master, we have two places for you to stay. One is by a rich gavir, a rich person who gives a lot of tzedakah. He's well learned, he's the Talmud Chachlam. And the other one is a peasant who's been bothering us. He only wants you to come. Please stay by him. He only has a bed made of straw. But we have to tell you, Master, that the problem is the Talmud Chachlam is a little bit egotistical. But perhaps you'll go in and out. You won't even have to worry about it, but that's where you're going to be the most comfortable. So the Baal Shem Tov stopped and thought a bit. He says, I want you to send me to the home of the peasant. For even though he has a bed made of straw, anybody with a large ego has no room for God. And I can't be in the same place with that person. So as we experience, as Hope mentioned also, the trials of this month, the ones that create for us times of tears and release, that we also have the beauty of creating space. We create an openness. As Hanabacha said, Shavisi Hashem Lenegdi Samit, I place Hashem before me always, that we're able to have that space for Hashem to come in and pour His light into us. And we also have the opportunity, as Rabbi Nachman says, for the bracha of forgetfulness. Does that mean? Many people, especially my geriatric patients, tell me that they can't remember where they put their keys. Something that happened 30 years ago is like something that happened yesterday. So Rabbi Nachman says, ah, people don't realize what a bracha forgetfulness is. We have the opportunity to take something challenging and completely erase it and get a new start. During the Yamim Narayim Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we have the opportunity for Hashem to completely forget the ways that we didn't measure up. But we also have to take that opportunity to forget. That we emerge now having shed tears with an openness and a yearning to receive that celestial groom, but also to forget the ways in which we've been hurt or hurt others, in which we've been disappointed or disappointed others. In the ways that we haven't been open. open. And then perhaps the ultimate heat voted to session of the year. We collectively, as an entire Jewish people all over the world, sit under our collective pecan tree and ask Hashem to hear us. We cry out to him. Tell him our deepest thoughts. 
but also the deepest uh, deepest thoughts of our collective soul, soul of souls, the entire Jewish people. And so that's my bracha for all of you that going in to the coming week, so you come closer to Rosh Hashanah, that you allow yourself to shed tears both of happiness and of sadness, that you open yourselves up to creating space for the supernal light that exists and is right here with us, that you realize that not even the direct experiences we have with Hashem, but even with other people, is Hashem giving us the opportunity to relate to and be with Him. That you find some time to sit down and be willing to forget the ways that perhaps you've fallen short. Because ultimately, your slate is going to be wiped clean. So Hashem should bless all of you. Give you determination and hope. Find light in the darkness. And only bracha and happiness for the coming week and the coming year of